What's it? Right? So you ask this person of the Ministry of Justice, in that case, what's the difference between extortion and taxation? It's exactly the same thing. So that's a question you can ask at the Ministry of Justice. And the other question you can ask the Ministry of Justice is how come you can't phone anyone for free to find out what the law is about things? Like I tried to find out what the law is about the General Assembly and I couldn't find it anyway, but I'm sure I'm just about to find out. Thank you very much for the very nice intro. Um, hello everybody, how are you today? Yesterday the, the weather report said it was going to rain. I don't think it's going to rain today. We're very fortunate. Um, we're very happy today to have Manuel Castells here. Um, I'm very excited about that uh, in, in several ways. Uh, he, he wrote about the notion of a network society, which uh, was describing networked organizational structure. One thing I realized here in the last couple of weeks, that his, uh, his models and his observations helped me understand the work that I'm doing here, uh, but also helped me understand uh, the structure that we want to build here. Uh, he is a prolific writer about uh, political structure, about economic structure. He's just finished editing a book on the nature of crises. And I have a feeling that uh, we're going to get an early glimpse from his uh, insights. Uh, we're very privileged to have him talk here. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Manuel, Cast Manuel Castell. Thank you, Martin. And uh, I want to... So I wanted to thank uh, Martin and also uh, the Occupy London movement for uh, inviting me to be with you here today. Uh, I have been uh, participating and analyzing and uh, working with the uh, movement, similar movements in Spain, as you know, in the United States. And this is clearly now picking up as a local global uh, network movement that uh, in a very dire situation in the world represents in my opinion the only the only chance to make people aware of what's going on what's going on is a system out of control destroying people's life to save banks and uh, the only way to stop it is to reinvent in politics uh, because the current political system simply doesn't work. It's dysfunctional for us. It's very functional for others. But I also think that beyond um, protest and beyond uh, denunciation, uh, we have to deepen our analytical understanding of what's going on. Uh, not because we are going to write doctoral dissertations about the matter, uh, but because we are those who really need to know better. Because when we want to change the world, we need to understand the world, uh, not to stop and uh, understand it, but as a way to change it and to transform it in terms of the interest of the majority of people, of the 99% of people, as they say, in the United States. So. Um, Martin asked me to uh, reflect with you on uh, the current work I have been doing for already quite a while, actually, since uh, uh, the fall of 2008, as soon as the crisis was open for everybody. Uh, I uh, started with a group of uh, friends and colleagues from around the world to proceed with a systematic analysis of the uh, economic crisis that was unfolding. So this is what I'm going to share with you. Uh, it's not published yet, so uh, probably this is the world premiere of the presentation of my analysis of the crisis. Uh, and um, then I will uh, try to uh, uh, leave enough time to at least interact with you in any way we can. Um, now, of course, it's easier to occupy Barcelona under the London wind, uh, but well, uh, we, are, we are moving far. Uh, far north, so uh, we have to adapt to all climatic and police conditions. Um, so, 
when the crisis, I, 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 I even they asked me to give a title, and I thought that a cute title was a "Crisis Always Rings Twice," um, because uh, when the, after the fall of Lehman Brothers in um, 2008, uh, governments massively intervened. I will come to this in a minute. Uh, after a few weeks, a few months, uh, everybody started to say, well, yeah, yeah, this is a crisis, but it's a limited crisis, and therefore um, it's gone, it's already going to be settled, the system is going to be restored, and that's it. And uh, yeah, it's, a, it's an accident, but uh, we will go back to normal soon. You will be able to borrow, consume, be happy with more cars, more houses, bigger houses, bigger everything, so don't worry, don't worry. Well, here we are again, uh, three years later, a much deeper crisis because the crisis has been metamorphosing itself. Um, and the, the reason for that, is this is uh, not a crisis, it's a system. Uh, and therefore, unless the roots of the crisis are corrected, um, it will continue to reproduce in different forms. Why? Because uh, at the root of this, uh, what, what we are living, and we have been living the last three years in most of the world, not in all of the world, but in most of the world, we have uh, a system which is literally unsustainable. Yes, it's capitalist, but saying that it's capitalist it doesn't take us very far. Because there are many forms of capitalism, and we need to know which are the, the particular species of capitalism uh, and this one is uh, what I called some time ago informational financial capitalism in which everything has been um, securitized. Everything has been transformed into securities, into the value of securities. And everything I mean, not only your savings, not only uh, the company, not only uh, uh, the, the actual assets, but time, time has been privatized and securitized. Futures, options, and options on different times and then different futures. So everything has been securitized and included into a massive global financial market that no one controls. No one controls. It's because it's unregulated, because it goes on its own, and has become what I call years ago an automaton an automaton that runs people's life. We have created a super robot, and this super robot is controlling everything we do. And therefore, every time we try to do something, say, well, yeah, but the markets, you know, the markets, we have to worship the markets, and we have to do human sacrifices to the markets to placate the ire of the markets. Who are the markets? You know personally any market? Um, and that's my point. My point is that this system has been created. It's a system designed, designed and enacted by people. Not like us, not people like us, but by people. Why? Because the people who first designed it were the politicians who deregulated everything and privatized everything and liberalized everything. Yeah, the usual suspects, Thatcher, Reagan, but everybody else. Everybody else. In other words, um, states, governments, privatize themselves to death. That's the critical thing. Uh, a new institutional system was created in which everything was left to the markets, and that was a political project, not an economic necessity. Moreover, this system is operated also by people, by what people call bankers, but it's much more complicated, is financial consultants, is uh, it's financial consultants, is financial analysts, uh, traders, all kind of people populate this world of the global financial market that control everything in the planet. Uh, these people are people who, in addition to the logic of maximizing profit, speculating, etc., they add their personal interests. They work on their quarterly bonuses, and they don't care about what happens afterwards. Take the money and run. And if the company goes belly up, and the financial stock goes belly up, they have billionaire indemnities 
that allow them to keep going on uh, from one place to another, from one country to another, from one market to another. So, again, these are also people. Moreover, uh, the logic of uh, the global financial markets is run by an ideology. The ideology, I call it market fundamentalism, uh, meaning that the market is self-corrected, that the market can do everything by itself. And any attempt to regulate the market goes against some basic nature, which is the market as the most efficient form of economic and social organization. Well, it's simply empirically false. And in fact, it's so empirically false that many years ago, in 2000, with a group of colleagues, some of them very well known, Will Hutton, Tony Giddens, uh, Paul Volcker, George Soros, uh, we published a book uh, in 2000. The title of the book was On the Edge in 2000, in which I wrote the chapter on how information technology and the automation of uh, trading and securitization of everything using powerful mathematical models was creating a system that was unsustainable because it was feeding itself on creating debt, expanding debt. The system works by selling debt and using the debt to create new debts on the basis of splicing securities of the insurance company that were supposed to uh, actually secure the production of this debt. So, at one point, the market did not rectify itself, did not control itself. The market went off control uh, through the process of what now is called the subprime lending, connected mainly to real estate businesses. But this subprime lending is not an accident. It was designed also to maximize the exposure of people who would have to keep repaying and repaying so that the profit of the financial system would increase dramatically. I can give you just one illustrative figure. I'm not going to talk the statistics here today, but just one interesting figure. The paradox, for instance, in the United States is that uh, this financial crisis and the collapse of the economy took place at the moment of the greatest increase of productivity linked to the new economy and to the information technology revolution in business and, and, and in the economy at large. Uh, during the period of um, oh, 1998, 2008, the 10 years before the, 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 the Lehman Brothers crisis, uh, productivity in the United States grew uh, in cumulative terms at 30%. 30% more productive the economy in these 10 years. But at the same time, the uh, real wages declined by 3% overall, and particularly for college-educated graduates. In the same period, the uh, financial industry increased its share of profits from 20% to 40%. In other words, all the bonuses of productivity went into the financial sector, not into the rest of the created productive economy. And the financial sector used this, in, this tremendous level of profits to create more capital, invent more capital, so to the point that today, uh, for, for one uh, euro or dollar or pound in the world that um, exists producing the economy, there are 50 50 pounds created as virtual capital. The, the ratio between what we produce and what we trade in the financial market is 1 to 50. It was 1 to 10 20 years ago. In other words, we have virtualized this capitalist system. It's much more than capitalism. It's fictitious capital. It's fictitious value. It's virtualized capital. Unregulated and fed only by the constant lending and relending borrowing and borrowing until the system went out of control. We know the story. If you don't know exactly the details, uh, look for two great movies, uh, Inside Job and Too Big to Fail, um, which tell you the story much better than any university lecture can tell. <laughs> by the way, by very good people, very solid people, PhDs from Berkeley, etc., etc. Watch these movies and, and the, the whole story is there. But then, what then? happened is that this famous 
government that should stay away from the markets was immediately called to the rescue and to save the financial system. And I say the financial system, not the banks, because in fact, 80% of the lending is not from the banks, it's from financial institutions. Uh, and therefore the system is much, much more complicated. Um, so governments came to the rescue uh, at the price of trillions of dollars taken from, from where? From our pockets. That's the point. So we save the banks, okay? Uh, God save the queen, but we save the banks. <laughs> so after that, uh, what happened, as, as you know, the simple logic of the process, that as soon as the banks were refloated, the banks are doing okay, thanks, in, in many countries. Not in all, not in Europe, not in Spain, for instance, and not in England. Um, as the Royal Bank of Scotland, for instance. Um, so, after that, credit was immediately curtailed to the real economy, and particularly to small and medium businesses that create about two-thirds of the jobs. And therefore, without credit, uh, companies stop working, stop hiring. Then people suddenly, on the one hand, they lost jobs, they lost wages, and they had to repay the mortgages. In some countries, like in Spain, they simply not only could not pay the mortgage and would lose their homes, but they still have to repay the rest of their life the loan they got. So in the United States, for instance, uh, if you lose, uh, you cannot pay your mortgage, they take away your home. In Spain, they take away your home, but you has, still have to pay forever, uh, even your funeral. So, because of that, uh, there was, a, from the financial crisis, we went into a crisis of the industry, and from there into a crisis of employment, and therefore, ultimately, governments had to, on the one hand, cover all these new needs that were increasing, on the other hand, assume the debts of the banks, on the other hand, uh, to, um, they had less revenue for obvious reasons uh, because they had uh, uh, people being spent, government could not recover taxes, etc., etc. So ultimately, it, what was a financial crisis metamorphosed itself into an industrial crisis, into an employment crisis, ultimately into a fiscal crisis, meaning government did not have enough money to cover all the obligations they had to assume. That moment is when the financial crisis metaphor metamorphoses itself into a new form of crisis, a social crisis, meaning that government stop social spending to a large extent and uh, try to save the situation by cutting off public jobs and public services rather than taxing the banks, regulating the banks, taxing the high income groups. Uh, and moreover, stopping what could be the sources of recovering the economy at two levels. In the short term, instead of putting in more money into the economy, taking money out of the economy, cutting, cutting spending, cutting spending. Now, it's like uh, someone who is almost dead, then you take out the blood transfusion. Uh, you stop the machine of reactivating the person uh, who is trying to fight for life. Uh, the key issue now is not so much fiscal balance, the key issue is to reactivate the economy, at least within the capitalist logic. I will come in a, in a second to other forms of logic. Second, the, everybody agrees that in the midterm, the only way to reactivate the economy, not in terms of uh, spending, cutting spending, the, a stimulus, uh, using public money to, so beyond the debate between neoclassical equilibrium and austerity and um, stimuli through a neo-Keynesian policy, be beyond that is a more fundamental thing. Reactivating the economy through innovation, uh, through knowledge economy, through the ability to create new forms of um, the uh, productivity creating real value. This is directly connected to the knowledge economy, to research, to innovation, 
to education, what governments are doing, are cutting university funding, are undoing education, they are cutting research funding. So, the, on the one hand, there is a fiscal, an attempt to create a fiscal balance by not spending, therefore not activating the economy in the short term, and cutting off the roots of innovation, productivity, and knowledge development that could reactivate the economy in the midterm. Why? They're not that stupid. Well, um, they are. Uh, <laughs> because they think they can get away with all this. Who are they? There is a triangle of power in our societies. A triangle doesn't mean a power elite. Doesn't mean a unified elite. It means three particular segments of dominant elites that have a set of interlocking networks which are which vary, which change, but that together close all the other exits. What is the financial system? With actual people who benefit and control the decision making, decision making of letting the markets decide, but with them in the helm of reaping the profits of these movements of the markets, first of all. Second, the media, the corporate media, which on the one hand own, uh, the, that are owned by the financial networks, and then the media own the politicians. Uh, you have some guy around here named Murdoch, no? Some uh, little connection with uh, Cameron and other people. But he had also excellent relationship with Blair. So this is beyond politics. And then third, the political class as a whole. Now, not, don't let me wrong. Not all parties are the same, but all together defend one particular system. It's, it's called democracy. And it's a, it is democracy, but it's a restrained form of democracy. Meaning, you create rules of the game, you make sure that no one can, goes out of the rules of the game, and then you negotiate and share power within the political class and within this particular uh, system. And yes, of course, you can vote for other parties. Sure, as the liberal democrats in Britain, for instance, and I'm not talking about the Revolutionary Party, uh, the, the, the rules of the game are determined by those who at the moment of establishing the rules of the game have enough power to impose the rules of the game. And therefore, there is one particular interest which is common, which is shared, not yet, not yet, uh, which is common, I haven't finished, let me finish the revolution. So, don't worry. I have been in Paris in May 68, this is not serious. <laughs> so, this particular form of power is very simple. Politicians rule within the institutions. They make sure the political class as a whole, as a whole, is safe. And then they debate among, them, among themselves. The financial system controls economic life, locally and globally. The media system tries, tries to control our minds. And then they relate to each other in different strategies, in different power games. Sometimes uh, it's very simple. Berlusconi takes over everything until we even got him. Uh, on, in other cases, it's more complicated. But ultimately, no one goes out of this triangle of power. So, what, if you look at the profits of the banks in the last three years during the crisis, they have kept increasing dramatically. In some cases, the highest in history. If you look at social spending, has been reduced. If you look at elections, it's very simple. When people are fed up with their government, they elect the other party, which will do the same policies, basically, at this point. We have a very spectacular case in Spain these days, the socialists were voted out because they were doing the right-wing policies all these years, and then uh, and then people elect the party that is going to do even more of these right-wing policies. So that's what I said in terms of closing the, the exits. One, and I will finish with that, one particular expression of um, the 
of the crisis is what's happening in the Eurozone these days, in which the connection between interests of elites and power and what happened in the economy is absolutely clear. The Euro as a currency, and I wrote this when the Euro was created, uh, can only be sustained under two conditions, as all currencies in history. Either the economies converge towards similar levels of productivity and competitiveness, that's one thing, and then express the same economies, or there is a transfer system between the economies of a very large scale until finally the whole economy converges, meaning that the currency ultimately has to be backed by one state. The euro was not predicated on the possibility of really converging economies. They didn't. Productivity levels, competitiveness levels, etc. And no state at that point existed to back up the currency. So who actually equalized the, the economic conditions throughout the Eurozone? The financial system, the banks. The banks said, look, since you can borrow in euros, don't worry if you are not productive. Don't worry if you are not competitive. We give you the money. You will pay later. Why? Because the banks, as the banks in the United States, as the banks everywhere, always think that they know that the markets fail. They know that the markets don't correct themselves. That's why they need governments. They need our money through governments because they need, they know that if things come to worse, they are too big to fail. So they have to be safe. So they know, no, it's no risk. It's actually no risk. This financial capital is worse for no risk because when the risk comes, instead of failing, they are bailed out by ourselves, except that we don't decide it. So ultimately, the financial arrangements in Europe consisted that governments would take care of different uh, economies by borrowing from German, French, American, British banks. That is a transfer of funds, but not a transfer of of public funds, a transfer of private financial capital that was backed by the banks and ultimately by the government. Which government? The government that uh, would be able to come to the rescue. Now, why Germany wants to, to is ready to fight to save the euro to the last Greek? <laughs> Because the most important uh, damage in the European economy would not be to Greece, would be to the German banks. Would be to the German banks. And uh, therefore, moreover, the whole model, this model economy, Germany, uh, growing, uh, being stable, uh, well, it's actually, you know what? It's not a German model, it's a Chinese model. <laughs> the economic model of Germany is the following. Reducing real wages, 3% in the last five years, uh, curtailing social benefits in agreement with the unions that want to preserve their jobs, and working on exports to the Eurozone particularly with an with a undervalued currency. What does it mean? Well, if let imagine for a moment that what's going to happen in a few weeks had happened before. The Euro mark and the Euro Lira. Huh? Well, Germany to export to Italy would have to, uh, the, the, its prices would be 30% more because the, the, the German economy, it would be different currency, it would be a much higher valued currency. And therefore, the export uh, from Germany to the Eurozone would not be competitive. The opposite is also true. Italian, Spanish, Greek exports, tourists for instance, um, would be much more competitive. So the, the country that really needs the euro is not Greece, it's Germany. France thought the same. The Mercosur was a, an, an, an attempt to bring together the interests of the two countries. But suddenly, 
because he decided that Merck was taking advantage of him <laughs> because uh, ultimately the financial markets continue to work. So now the German, uh, the, the French debt, the French public debt is undervalued now vis-a-vis -vis the German debt. So ultimately, all these differences between euros and different countries, no, it's one country with a so-called real euro and all the other eurozone are false euros. Come on. <laughs> so, it's, as you know, it's being openly debated these days in all the countries, including France, to create what they call a two-speed eurozone and a three-speed euro. Well, first of all, the euro doesn't mean the end of the, the beginning of the end of the European Union. After all, 10 of the 27 are not in the euro. Um, it doesn't mean that there are no problems. Look at Britain. But it means that, for instance, Poland, which is the, mo the best performing economy now in Europe, is not in the euro. They want to go into the, into the euro. And that why? Because of the Polish elite wants to be part of that club. Um, but fundamentally, the conditions, both structural and in policy terms, of the unity of the eurozone do not exist anymore. And therefore, uh, you have euros, try to put it in some other currency. Yuan, for instance. Uh, it is really coming now. We are moving fast toward the disintegration of the eurozone. Because as Europe, uh, a eurozone at two or three levels is not a eurozone by definition. Let's not play with words. Um, and this is unsustainable because, among other things, uh, even if Merkel wants to save the German bank, even if Merkel wants to keep the, supreme, the economic supremacy of Germany over Europe, the German voters, uh, because they have been told that these Greeks and these uh, Spaniards and all these pigs uh, are proliferate and desirable people, why we have to save them? And since no one has told them the truth, Germans are now blocking any solution. Remember, in one of the most democratic and interesting countries in Europe, Finland, at the last election this year, a unknown party, party that was unknown before, the true Finns, got 21% of the vote with one, only one point in their, in their program. Not to help Portugal. Why Portugal? Well, probably they hated Portugal. Uh, not to help Portugal. That was the only point in the program, 21% of the vote. In other words, this famous European citizenry, European solidarity, everybody loving each other, come on. Uh, everybody is at this point trying, in the formal trend terms, trying to save himself or herself. Unless there is something different. Unless these are the kind of people like those who are here. Unless there is another Europe that is being formed. Not the Europe of an unsustainable Europe. Not the Europe, not the Europe of these elites that dance with each other, uh, always trying to remove themselves from the control of their citizens. Referendum for the Greeks to decide? Come on, impossible. Uh, it's crazy. Referendum politics these days. Asking the people what to do? Are you irresponsible? People know nothing. We know. What they know is how to preserve their interests this triangle of power. This is not an economic crisis. This is a political crisis. And the political crisis is both in terms of the institutions that cannot manage the system anymore, and is in terms of the public opinion and the support that has been generated by occupied movements around Europe and around the world. 73% uh, of the people in Spain support the, what the movement is saying. Uh, and then, yes, they vote for the Conservative Party. Well, that's a schizophrenia, politically speaking. <laughs> but they, in terms of the content, of the substance, they support what the movement says. But they would not support a movement party, because that would be against the, the same game. So what? So what for the future? Well, we don't know. We know one thing. What we have doesn't work. It's dysfunctional. What we have goes directly to a second catastrophe. Because the crisis rings twice, but the third time is not a crisis, it's death, remember, the little book. And in that sense, what you are trying to do is simply 
start at least raising the questions, opening up the public debate, and we'll see what happens. We know we don't want and we cannot go from where we come. As for the future, we have to make it. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have some time for questions. Uh, if you want to ask a question, uh, please line up here and uh, ask a question on the mic. Um, I want to ask you to uh, keep your question brief. Um, we don't have a lot of time. And maybe let me start with the first one. Let me go back to the very beginning of your talk. You, you were saying that you spent some time uh, with, the, uh, Spanish uh, with the Spanish protests. Uh, I'm wondering if you have observations to offer that uh, you can share here. Maybe you can offer some advice based on experiences with the Spanish protest that we could use here in, uh, in London. Well, not, not advice at all, because I would not dare to advise anyone. Actually, it would be dangerous if you take my advice. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I, can, I can tell you what, what I think uh, I have retained myself as myself, as a person, uh, from the experiences. The most important thing, the most important thing, is to stick to the principle of non-violence. This is fundamental. The whole strategy of the powers that be is to create an image of violence surrounding the movement. This is what already in the United States, for instance, uh, there was a, co a meeting to coordinate attacks on the uh, encampments uh, in uh, 15 different cities of the United States to create violence. There is, in Italy, in general, there was an infiltration, as typical from the Black Bloc, uh, to create violence in the moment of the demonstration. And you know what? The same week, three days before, the demonstration uh, in, uh, in Rome, um, the Italian television controlled by Berlusconi uh, showed a, re a, a special report of two hours on the violence in Genoa in 2002. Coincidence? Um, this is the most fundamental tactics to delegitimize the movement because people, as soon as they see images of violence, two things happen, visually. First, you don't think about anything else. You don't see the content. You don't see the faces. Uh, and second, these are violent people. You don't want to, make, to mix up with them. And yeah, they may be right, but this is a radical, another radical movement. Be careful. So this is the most fundamental thing. Second, uh, in, in positive terms also, because the media fundamentally are against, uh, they will falsify, lie about the movement, uh, dismiss it with the help of very sophisticated intellectuals that say, well, they have no program, no organization, no leadership. This contradicts the experience of democracy, and actually, this could be a threat for democracy. Uh, so they sentence before analyzing. Uh, because of that, it is essential for the movement to develop its own network of communication and debate in relationship not only within the movement, not only with the other webs of Occupy uh, every place in, in the world, but toward the society. And we have the internet. The big difference between 68 in Paris and now is that we have the internet. And the internet can reach everybody. And it's absolutely important what you are doing today here with the blog, with, the, with, with, with uh, uploading to YouTube. Uh, so alternative media, is this the absolutely necessary subject of alternative politics. So these are the two things that I would really emphasize. Um, I've, been, I've been told, I've been, uh, I, I have listened that uh, we need to gain control over the economy the local economy in order to gain back control over the welfare of our communities. And uh, I would like to know um, how the alternative media that you just mentioned and internet can contribute to this local economy. Thank you. Uh, 
thank you. Um, you see, uh, when I mention uh, the possibility of creating alternative forms of economy and economic life, I don't only refer to the movement acting to regulate the banks. Uh, there are, around the world, new forms of economic life developing, and these are not marginal. I just finished, a, we're still doing it, but basically finished a big study on, on Barcelona. First, on the local groups that live differently in cooperative terms, in terms of barter networks, etc. But I also, I also uh, did a survey of a representative sample of the population of Barcelona. And incredible things are there, which uh, economists never consider, because they don't look at them. They look at, at their mathematical models, and, and that's it. Uh, for instance, to give an example, 35% of the people of Barcelona, at large, during the crisis, had given money without, had lent money without interest to people who were not their relatives. About 300,000 people are members of credit cooperatives, uh, barter networks are spreading throughout the world. Barter networks. Network, well, in Estonia, some people know, there is something called the Bank of Happiness. The Bank of Happiness, if you go to there and you give uh, your time, I can do that many hours and I, here is the list of the things I can do. And other people can, and they exchange, right? Uh, so, barter networks, social currency, all these are local economies. Now, why social currency is very important, why? Because it's a currency, you, you pay for services or for goods, but it's within a particular network which has to be local, but it's local and global, because it's something called a community exchange network, which is in 42 countries, and there are thousands and thousands of people there, so they are local, but if you go to that country, in that particular network, with your currency from Spain or from France, you can also operate there, but it's a completely parallel system. Yeah, sure, this is not going to overrun the global economy today. But it's a scaling up from local economies that bring meaning to people's life and they're under their control. So all this is a process. If we see it simply in a snapshot, looks like utopia. Uh, but if we look as a process, scaling up, creating mixed forms, that is certainly more effective that the kind of economic policies that are failing again and again. And by the way, every time that you, you hear this is utopia, remember one thing. Utopias are not crazy stuff. Utopias are material forces because liberalism has been an utopia. Anarchism has been an utopia. Socialism has been an utopia. Even communism has been an utopia. And then, of course, the relationship to reality depends on countries. Or, but the materials of which our minds are made are made at the same time of demands and pressures, but also of dreams. And these dreams are called utopias, but these dreams transform reality. Hi, Professor. Thank you for speaking. Uh, you spoke about the liberation of of the space as being a very important thing. Uh, so my question is the following. How important are the technological innovations coming out of this liberated space? Can we simply rely on reappropriating the Facebooks and YouTubes of the internet? Or should we be focusing on developing new technologies within the liberated spaces to move the, to, I guess, preserve the autonomy and move the uh, movement forward? Thank you. This is absolutely central, what you just said. Um, we have to, we are already doing, we are occupying Facebook, okay? So that's uh, the, the first thing we all move and did is to occupy Facebook, which is a good idea. Um, without Facebook, many of the things would not have started to happen. And then, of course, the second, the occupation of public space, and particularly of symbolic space, is fundamental because that makes it visible and is the connection between cyberspace and urban space which is the originality of these movements around the world. And you know, the first space occupied in Barcelona, in the Plaza of Catalonia, was immediately called Tahrir Square. The first occupation in New York was called Tahrir Square. And Tahrir Square today is still people being killed and resisting at the same time. So, 
in that sense, the occupation of public space is fundamental. But then, it's always a feedback movement. Uh, it's always some kind of dialectics between the occupation of cyberspace, the occupation of urban space, and then as you absolutely said, beyond occupying Facebook, let's create our Facebook. While we're still occupying Facebook, okay? It's not. <laughs> but the technological innovation that is happening in the occupied communities, the 2,700 2, communities occupied around the world, the technological innovation is extraordinary. There is a, a network that has been already created in the United States that is called Occupy Research, uh, which they, on the one hand, do research on the occupying and occupy the research institutions, okay? Actually, it's interesting. Three weeks ago, I was at MIT, uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Harvard was occupied the day I was there. I didn't do it, but Harvard was occupied. Uh, two days ago, I was in Cambridge, England. A building in Cambridge was occupied. So every time you go somewhere, anywhere in the world, something is being occupied, just being occupied, just being evicted. Uh, in all these places has been extraordinary technological innovation. People are developing programs. They are creating webs like that. They are creating new forms of interface uh, in real time. And on other things, because at one point, not yet, but at one point, networks will start being cut off. Um, networks will start being intervened. And, and uh, the, the, the actual cyber pirates, which are the government agencies specialized in cyber attacks, are going to start intervening. This is only the very beginning. The more the movement goes on, you will see more violence, more cyber attacks, and more anger from right-wing groups. So we have to get ready for that. And the movement, I must say, has a technological superiority because it's a new generation of tech-savvy people who understand that they don't have to rely on technology. They have to rely on themselves as networks of people. But using the most advanced software and the most advanced communication technology, we are much more powerful than those who simply rely on uh, hitting people with uh, paper gas. I should point out that this uh, talk is being live streamed by this team right here. And uh, there's a community watching this and uh, chatting and also giving us questions to ask. This, this is a question from uh, Cyberspace. Uh, the, the question is, should the Occupy movement declare sovereignty and empower themselves to pass laws and print currency? They are doing it. Uh, you don't have to declare sovereignty. You, you simply have to take it uh, to be sovereign. Uh, movements are run by assemblies. Uh, and the assemblies are the people who are in the assembly. And if uh, the following day other people are in another assembly, well, that's a shift in sovereignty. Uh, this is absolutely critical. The process is much more important than the outcome by now. This is a historic process of reconstruction of society and politics from the bottom up. So step by step, and therefore, yes, the most important thing is to assume, to assume that we have the right to decide on our lives not on other people's lives, not to dictate to the rest of society or to anyone sitting side by side. To us, to us, we are sovereign. In other words, we are sovereign. We don't have to claim sovereignty, we have just to live as if we were sovereign. That's very important. And as for uh, creating local currency, again, as, as I said, yes. And, uh, but remember, in order to use the currency, not simply to have a symbol, uh, a print note with the St. Paul's Cathedral it would be nice actually um, but we have to use it to trade something so we have to produce services to produce goods to produce something so we need a local economy before we have local currencies so uh, that's the one thing that we could start doing I, I could think for instance taking care of other people's children you know uh, that's a very important thing uh, before liberating the world, we have to liberate the children and the women, <laughs> usually the women, uh, who have to take care of the children. So we have to create a network of barter, of 
services of goods of everything, and then the local currency makes some sense. In other words, we cannot reproduce the symbols of sovereignty 